but they're really old. Um, but, uh, anyway, um, so this is from that. Supposedly, if you read the whole of it, or back in the day, if you read the whole of it, you would have the equivalent of a Harvard education. So I think that's cool. I'd way rather read a bunch of books than have to go to school. Although Harvard has a really nice campus. When I used to live in Boston, I spent a bit of time on it, and I loved walking across it, seeing its big trees. Oh, okay. So this is some of Don Quixote. The first part. Yeah, Don Quixote was published in two parts, which I appreciate the precedent since the book I have been working on for over 10 years has grown so big it's now it's been split into two parts. Hey, uh, Art Spiegelman did that with Mouse, too. It's, you know, sometimes the work just takes as long as it takes. So I don't know exactly why I have this. It's just part of Don Quixote. Hmm. Does this deserve to be in our collection? It's kind of nice. But it's just part of Don Quixote. Maybe when I got it, I had the insane notion that I would eventually get all of these. But this is like the only one of these I've ever even seen around. And if I ever do see, have a chance to buy the whole set, they'll probably be together. Yeah, it's not hurting my shelves by being on them. Oh, this is a literary journal, Bacopa. Remember earlier in like the first video, I said Albert Haley, author of Home Ground, was my editor at the journal Bacopa from Gainesville, awesome punk town in Florida where my friend Jessica Mills is from. And uh, I'm in here. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, oh, I'm not on the page award-winning page. I'm on this page. Look, the speed of grass, the speed of us. Michael Farrell Smith. This is the first time I used the name Michael Farrell Smith, not Mike Smith or Mike Smith of Albuquerque. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm in here. Let me see if I can find it. Page 191. Look at this. So I wrote this piece. It's a sentence fragment. It's a 2,000 uh, some word essay, but it's a sentence fragment and it's punctuated only by dashes. And oh, there's hyphens in it. There's occasional hyphens and a few compound adjectives, I think. But um, you know, the speed of grass, the speed of us. It's the description not of a photograph, but of the one sixtieth of one second that it took at this time for a digital photograph to uh, snap its lens. And I was thinking like, that's really interesting because you have it captured, compressed into an image, but what was really happening during this time? And it is actually based on a specific photograph. It's, this is nonfiction. It's a memoir of 1 60th of one second. The editor, when they accepted it was like, I love it, I hate it, it's frustrated me, it's great. That's cool. Um, I think I thought about indenting it maybe every so often, even though keeping the, the punctuation just for the ease for the, of the reader when I adapt it. It'll be a chapter in the second volume of my experimental memoir, which is a super fragmentary, you know, metamodern, postmodern, um, you know, look at a life from all these different perspectives in different ways, different scopes. Um, a memoir, a fraction of an instant, in a fraction of a place, an exploration of something so fleeting, one sixtieth of one second, more momentary than a moment, a world of time in time, rushing, rushing, surging, flooding, from the sixtieth of a second that came before, toward and into, the sixtieth of a second bound to follow, a progression so inevitable, instantaneous, pure motion, whatever that is, the apparent motion of time, whatever that is, a moment, yes, a moment, whatever that is, so fleeting there could be no room at all for anyone to make any choice within it, not consciously anyway, a moment like all moments, seemingly still and yet made of movement, unstoppable, relentless, fast, something so small it is maybe only a description of something larger, one sixtieth of one second, on maybe one quadrillionth of the surface of the earth, an infinitesimal portion of all time and all space arbitrarily parceled away, held down, held close by a piece of shining sidewalk, a trapezoid of growing lawn, a cracking concrete slab, and 
along almost all that by the front of the house, its eroding pink-orange bricks, its glistening white trim, its slumping screen door, the lawn settling up against it like a newly broken wave, closing liquidly around a branching lavender bush, around greenery tangling beneath a faucet, around a snaking of garden hose, around two volcanic young elms rising uninvited from a grass-erupting flower box beside the slab, the slab, a raft, and riding that raft, a family, a family of four. Blah, blah, blah. And it goes on. No, not blah, blah, blah. I love this piece. And I have something to say in it. And the number of words are the exact, uh, it's like whatever year that um, photo was taken in, that's how many words there are in it. <laughs> I love little stuff like that. It's fun. And anytime you can condense things down, working within specific word counts is a way that I really think you can make prose shine because you're just always trying to make every word count and do more things. This is another literary journal, but I'm, I keep it because it has a piece in it by Suzanne Rivica, and she is a writer to watch. I'm telling you, I also have an issue of the sun around here that she's in. She, is, she approaches nonfiction the way that I approach it when I'm really, like, trying my best. And, uh, she, you know, she... She writes about her own life, but she realizes that there's no one perspective, not even her own, that's correct in writing about it. And like, she has one where it's like, she's writing in this collective voice of all the people uh, that are at her school, that are in this certain group. I'm trying to remember what it was specifically, but I will definitely reread all of her work that I have. I don't even know if she, I think she has a book of fiction out already, but I'm waiting for that essay collection that will be forthcoming. I hope we like end up in an anthology together or something sometime. Super cool writer, Suzanne Rivica. Quartet for the end of time. Advanced reading copy. Oh, here's why I have this. It has a blurb from Tim O'Brien on it. A brilliant work of art. This wholly realized book has everything I crave in a work of fiction. By Johannes Skibskrid. I am jealous of people with interesting last names. As a Mike Smith. If I ever do edit this crazy project down into a movie, I can only imagine the reviews. Often Mr. Smith just spaces out. Um, submission, a novel by Michel Hulebeck, author of The Elementary Particles. I must admit this cover kind of drew me in. It's so sinister and stark and strange. This is basically, it's kind of like a more left-wing writer is writing a take on a right-wing fantasy. At least I, I really hope that's what it is. I kind of feel like it is. Like, so basically Islam takes over um, the world in this, at least, you know, the country he's in, France. Yeah. Um, and uh, this unethical professor, yeah, France's new Islamic party, that's what it was. Women are veiled, polygamy is encouraged. Huh. Adam Gopnik, who is an awesome writer, in The New Yorker has said of submission that Michel Hulebeck is not merely a satirist, but more unusually a sincere satirist, genuinely saddened by the absurdities of history and the madnesses of mankind. Yeah, I, w I found it compelling. It drew me along. It left me thinking. Um, you know... It's strangely like an apolitical novel about political ideas or with political ideas as a backdrop or context. At least I hope. Who knows? Books are such a mirror, you know? Something you read one day may be totally cool and then you read it five years later and it may just like offend you on some level or it just doesn't work for you. You know, we're always changing. And Iliad. So this is not the Iliad. This is... A bold reimagining of our civilization's greatest tale of war by the author of the acclaimed bestseller Silk. Alessandro Barrico recreates the siege of Troy through the voices of 21 Homeric character characters in the narrative idiom of our modern imagination. Huh. No more detachment. It's all personal. You know, <laughs> someday I want to read like I want to create my own literary universe or something like that where all the characters are connected. You could probably do it. How many could you draw in? You could start with a work like Moby Dick where like pretty much every character in Moby Dick has had their own book now. 
um, or the Odyssey. There's literally a book about Argos, Homer's dog. My kids have it. <laughs> Not Homer's dog. Uh, uh, Ulysses. Wait. Odysseus. His dog. I think that's so funny. <sighs> Rabelais. Speaking of Everett Ruiz, he called himself a pantheistic hedonist, and he loved Rabelais. Some of his works are rather bawdy. I believe he wrote Gargantua and Pantagruel. Great books of the Western world. It's always interesting to have a book that's like from a series and you don't have the series. 1952 by Encyclopedia Britannica. Biographical note, 1483 and 1500. You know, this project really is pandemic born. I'm just <laughs> Oh, I believe this is African fiction. Wizard of the Crow. Nagogi Wa Thiongo. From the exiled Kenyan novelist, playwright, poet, and literary critic critic. A magisterial comic novel that is certain to take its place as a landmark of post colonial African literature. in exile now for more than 20 years. Oh my gosh. Wow. African satire of African geopolitics. Yep. I was happy to pick it up. <laughs> A sprawling allegory starring an African dictator who isn't having the best of times. I love how I spill coffee on everything. It's great. No, that could have been left in my car. Sometimes books get... My car is like... <laughs> All those scenes in movies and TV where a character gets out of a vehicle and alcoholic bottles spill out. That's me with books in my vehicle sometimes. I love the free boxes and I'm always acquiring books. The Adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow. I briefly followed an Instagram feed where somebody just kept tweeting like hundreds of copies of this book. Not tweeting posting. Maybe it's great. 1953. Oh, it is great. Okay, never mind. It's great. <sighs> no. Penguin great books of the 20th century. See, I, I appreciate that stuff. I appreciate the gatekeepers of time, I suppose, in some ways. I mean, I like knowing what's good. But of course, you know, it requires a bit more work beyond just uh, having a few big publishing companies tell you what you've got to explode the canon on your own you've got to read widely and um, you know I appreciate the libraries for just always sending new stuff my way I swear I, I think I I've really been sad since the libraries have been closed during all this originally published in 1953 Saul Bellow's modern picaresque tale oh that's always fun that means like a roguish adventure right Grandly illustrates 20th century man's restless pursuit of an elusive meaning. Augie March, a young man growing up in Chicago during the Great Depression, doesn't understand success on other people's terms. Fleeing to Mexico. Yeah, I'll check it out sometime. Great modern short novels. Or I won't. Or I'll die with it un never having been read. Oh, that's pretty. That's great. That reminds me of like a dystopian sci-fi hallway. Imagine this world it's all like black obsidian. It's shiny but it's full of technology. You just can't see it. And then there's this single gray path through it. The wall is like half a mile high up on each side. But then there's a winding walkway around it so that you can view it from above too. Anyway, that's what I'm seeing here. <laughs> uh, great modern short novels. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Oh. I, I am, I'm attached to this story. The Red Pony. All I know is that's referenced in Matilda by Roald Dahl. Daddy, it's called The Red Pony. And it isn't rubbish, it's beautiful. I listened to Matilda on audiobook a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> Third Man by Graham Greene. Ah, oh, there's that awesome movie. I didn't know that was based on a Graham Greene story, or if I did, I forgot. Agnosia. Thank you, Maggie Nelson, for that term. With its wonderful zither score and post-war Viennese setting. A Single Pebble by John Hersey. Never read any Hersey except Hiroshima. 
which I like the original edition of, but not the updated edition of. Elizabeth Spencer, okay, one woman. Sees the day, Saul Bellow. Requisite Tiffany's drink of body. Yes, I think I remember the film, and as I recall, I think we both kind of liked it. Well, I guess that's one thing we've got. Um, I don't know, I guess I like books like that. I'm in the mood for everything once in a while. Tale of Genji. Okay, this is like the classic, great. So it's a, a Japanese work. Superbly written and genuinely engaging. One of those works that can be read and reread throughout one's life. Technically, that's all works, but it's good that someone thinks that more about this. Tale of Genji. I've always wondered if you could just make a book a classic by rereading it a bunch of times. Like, because if you think about it, like the Bible is kind of an example like that. Like, a lot of those stories, they're like two verses, but they've been retold and reimagined and expanded and taught about and thought about for so long that they're way bigger than just those three verses on the page. When you have, like, centuries of art traditions, of paintings, of the characters and things like that, you know, um, what if you just, what if some random stupid book, like some dollar store pulp novel, you know, would it eventually be great because you would gain greater understanding from it? Because you would if you under, if you treated it as a holy text. Maybe not a phone book or something like that, but even that you could get some basic les lessons about like multicultural coexistence and <laughs> commerce and stuff. I don't know. Or like a, yeah, I don't know. Lots of fun ideas to explore. Anyway, The Tale of the Genji by Morisaki Shikibu. What's it about? Written in the 11th century, this exquisite portrait. Oh, I wanted to say earlier when I mentioned Gilgamesh, I got the date of it way wrong. Not 2,300 years ago, like 5,000 years ago. Written in the 11th century, the exquisite portrait of court life in medieval Japan, this exquisite portrait, is widely celebrated as the world's first novel. Oh, wow. I forgot that. Ignosia again. And is certainly one of its finest. Genji, the shining prince, is the son of an emperor. He is a passionate observer. A passionate character whose tempestuous nature, family circumstances, love affairs, alliances, and shifting political fortunes form the core of this magnificent epic. Royal Tyler's superb translation. Royal Tyler. Normal Tyler sucks. Royal Tyler. He's very royal. Cold Mountain. It's a heartbreakingly beautiful story, elegantly told and utterly convincing down to the last haunting detail. John Brandt, author of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is a, uh, like a true novel, like uh, In Cold Blood. Why are they always true crime? Why aren't true novels ever just like about cool animals? <laughs> or, uh, you know, a band you like. <laughs> I want to write a true novel about the Jayhawks because their band has really had some ups and downs. <laughs> Let's see. Cold Mountain is the best Civil War novel since Michael Shara's The Killer Angels. Written in a style equal to that of Shelby Foote, this novel deserves any and all prizes that might be lying about. Kay Gibbons. Oh, Rick Bass has a quote on the back. That is why I own this. This novel is so magnificent in every conceivable aspect and others previously unimagined that it has occurred to me that the shadow of this book and the joy I received in reading it will fall over every other book I ever read. Whoa, dude. It seems even possible to never want to read another book. So wonderful is this one. <laughs> Cold Mountain is one of the great accomplishments in American literature. Wow. That's way over the top. Nicole Krauss got crap for her over-the-top review of... Uh, <laughs> what was it that one time? Um, but um, it seems even possible to never want to read another book. So wonderful. But you know what? I know that afterglow of reading a truly great work. I get it. I get it, man. Huh. It's since been turned into a movie, I know. Okay, what else we got here? Mr. Mom himself, W. Somerset Mom. Wait, does that mean this is a memoir? In which case it should not be in the section. 
Giles. 50 cents. On human bondage, four short pieces. Like, what is the writer, like, of this era and, like, this guy even like, I wonder? Philip was moved into the sixth, but he hated school now with all his heart, and having lost his ambition, cared nothing whether he did ill or well. He woke in the morning with a sinking heart because he must go through another day of drudgery. He was tired of having to do things because he was told. That seems okay. <laughs> For whom the bell tolls. Skip to the back, it's just like some guy's name. Rick. <laughs> um, <laughs> why didn't you put that in the front? No, it's upside down in the back, like Encyclopedia Brown. Tolls for Rick. And Bugs Meany. Um, uh, Hemingway. You know, yep, there's a lot of this guy's books kicking around. This is a signature on the front. I need a better, more legible signature. Maybe I'll practice mine. I've had a couple of signatures in my life and they've all sucked. Oh, that's why I have this book. Look at that. My dad's adopted mom. When my dad was a little boy in post-war LA, his parents went out, left the kids in charge of each other like you do back in the day with another couple. And then their car overturned and caught fire and they burned to death inside their car. My dad and his siblings were left orphaned and then parceled out to all of the various family members. And then there was some reordering and shuffling as like his little sister was just distraught at not being able to, no, his older sister was just distraught at not being able to be with, quote, her feral, my feral. Um, and so she was sent back to him. But then his older sister, was it Elaine? Oh no, I've jumbled them around. Elaine was the one that was distraught and crying. Surely his oldest sister, she got basically sent away to a relative that just made her a slave. Like, not even kidding. She kept trying to run away, and they was, she was called a juvenile delinquent and caught, caught, caught and sent back. And, um, and they both had really sad fates. Both his sisters died. Really sad ways. One suicide, one murder. But uh, this was the wife of Charlie, the brother of his dad. Elva Smith, I met her when she was 159 years old. She was so old that Jim Henson had to maintain her using an elaborate system of pulleys. And uh, she was literally born in 1899. Her husband was born in like 1895. And I remember them both sitting in this place in LA, in this house that was just like overgrown with weeds. Like the weeds were just surrounding the house in a big furry enclosure. And there was a big bowl of taffy they let us have, but the taffy was so hard that like it would break your teeth and we couldn't get it out of the bowl. <laughs> but, but you know, she and her husband took in my dad. And even though I think her husband was abusive to him sometimes, but my dad is like of the era where he's like, oh yeah, we just whack me around, hit me all the time. I'm over it. You know, <laughs> something like that. That's a paraphrase, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, my dad, he said he was kidnapped by drifters during that time, thrown into a big sack, and he fought his way out and ran home. And then it was just like not a thing again. When he was a kid also growing up in Inglewood, which is now just a suburb of L.A., um, he said uh, they would map out the sewers and explore everywhere. <laughs> my dad had a very interesting childhood. That's why I have this book. I'm not like some Hemingway super fan. Though I do think he's a, a voice writers need to reckon with and think about. I actually read this when I was like under 10, I think. Complete Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle. Back, oh, and look who else. That was my dad's adopted moms too. Belva Smith. Belva. Man, names back then. And Mormon Western names. My God. I had a, my biological grandma, the one who died in that car, fiery car wreck. Her name was Drusa. And there are male names of that same sort, like Verl, and Delbert, and Clord. Complete Sherlock Holmes. Elva Smith. <laughs> she really went crazy writing her name on this one. I'm not letting you rip my name off of one page. So yeah, Sherlock Holmes, classic.
detective character. My kids were asking me who the most famous detective was, and somebody said Sherlock Holmes, and I was like, yeah, but who's the most famous nonfiction detective? And none of us could even think of one. You know? I kind of thought of J. Edgar Hoover, I guess, because, like, the head of the FBI. But, um... <laughs> That's interesting. He's, he's so much more famous than any real detective. I find that amusing. I have read those forever ago and seen so many movies and stuff. This book, Last on the Shelf, I loved this book back in the 90s. I'm not technically... I'm, I could consider myself the last year of Generation X because some lists include 1979. But I'm an Xennial. I'm in that transitional mini era between Gen X and uh, Gen Z. You know, sometimes called Gen Y. No, between mill Millennials. Between Gen X and the Millennials. So we're Xennials. I guess it's technically just called Xennials, but why is that? It's a portmanteau of X and Millennial. So I'm not pronouncing it that way. I think it's stupid. Groundbreaking novel. Uh, Tales for an Accelerated Culture, Douglas Copeland. This is a really interesting, just digressive book. He, It's experimental. Probably zine-influenced, which I love. Magazine-influenced, too. You know, alternative media-influenced. Comics and stuff in the sides, funny definitions. I really, really loved it back in the day. I wonder how well it's aged. I thought about rereading it. Kind of, I picked it up here and there again and again. <laughs> Look at that distinctive cover. Sun faded in a really weird way. It looks like it was probably on the top of a shelf and there was a book that was sitting on top of it and it sun faded around it. Okay, that's all of the literary fiction case. And, um, I need to dust these shelves before I put the books back. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. Next, we're going to review the books that are stacked up on top of the piano, and Mara's going to provide a score since she knows more about them than I do. They're really hers. <laughs>